Yes, we are live. Ah, finally. <laughs> Hello, guys. Sorry for the few minutes of delay. We have some technical issue, but I think now we're all good. Um, so I'm here tonight. So I'm Marie, for those who are coming for the first time. I'm here tonight with Soline. So Hi, hello, Soline. Hello. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to put this. Yeah, I think that's better. And um, yeah, so tonight, Celine and I will uh, go around the Louvre Museum. Uh, I just going to be there to listen to all your questions. You can, of course, comment on the chat, like, uh, like always. And we're going to take your question. And uh, maybe we can say first hello to everyone that is uh, that is here tonight. So thank you guys for watching. So we have uh, we have Darren here. We have uh, Leono God Nine, <laughs> Gentadam uh, Lady Audra, and uh, Ernest. Oh, Audra! Audra is a friend of mine from New York. <laughs> ah, yeah, okay. joining for the first time. Hi. <laughs> uh, so Bertrand is here too so that's perfect so guys if you have any question about the Louvre in general we're gonna talk about that to today tonight but um, I wanted Celine to present uh, what she likes the most in the Louvre and I saw a little comment oh hello Maria I saw a little comment saying please don't do Mona Lisa uh, so now I'm gonna ask Celine are you going to talk about Mona Lisa tonight, Celine? No, I wanted to avoid the two big hits because I know like people have always the same stereotypes about the Louvre. So I wanted to do something a little bit different. And altogether in the Louvre, we have 35,000 artworks. So there are so many that need to be discovered. So I went a little bit off the beaten path and yeah, it was really hard to choose just five artworks. But yeah, I'm in my own... Uh, favorite selection. So I hope I'm going to take you to places that you don't know yet. Okay, perfect. Um, we also have uh, Audra and Joan, Ginger and Alexander following us tonight. So again, guys, don't hesitate to just uh, write uh, something on the chat if you have any question or any comments. So, um, so Lynn, maybe we can talk just a little bit about you first, and then we're going to go into the Louvre uh, through this uh, virtual tour. Uh, so how did you become a guide or what was your path, let's say, into art history? Well, I did many different things. Uh, like a lot of guides very often we have like, you know, we are interested in a, in a whole branch of different things. So I started actually studying contemporary dance, but that was like almost 20 years ago. So that's how I got into the arts. And then this led me into art history and uh, yeah, I got more and more into the museum. And I also have a background as um, a family of artists, like my dad's an artist. So I was always surrounded with artworks. And then I went to study at La Sorbonne University in Paris in um, a cultural mediation. It's basically how to talk about artworks to different type of audiences. And I started uh, really as a full-time uh, guide for almost four years ago. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that sounds great. And so, so you choose the Louvre. I actually, what happened is I I asked the guides of my Paris uh, who is up to show some art pieces, and uh, you choose the museum, you choose the piece of art, and so you choose the Louvre. Is that really your favorite of all? Yeah. Basically, I. Uh, even a few years back, I was really way more into contemporary art. And the more I get to work in the Louvre, because of course, as tour guides in Paris, people always want to go to the Louvre. So that's where we end up spending, you know, half our, our life in the Louvre. And I got more and more into it with time because there's always something that you can discover. It's just so big and there's such, you know, such a variety of different artworks that are exhibited, different periods. It's huge, you can just get lost and see things for the first time all the time. So it's impossible to get bored. So that's what I really enjoy the most. And, you know, currently, because we can't go there, uh, I haven't been able to go just like everyone since uh, the end of October before the last lockdown. So, you, so I've been you're, really- so You're missing it, right? You're missing it. Yeah, the and it's, okay. I must say, yeah, it's really one of my favorite museums because you, yeah, always something to discover. 
Okay, so let's jump in then. Um, so I'll let you share your screen um, yeah. with us. And so guys, I'll again, share. you can continue saying bonsoir. We are Vince uh, and G de Valence telling that they are excited for tonight. So, so can you see my screen okay? I can see your screen. Um, maybe can everyone. Can... Uh, let's see uh, if we I think we're good. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll let you in the good end. Celine, now I'm 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 there, but yeah, now it's all you, Celine. So tell us. Yeah, so if at any point I'm going to walk you, of course, through uh, different pictures. If you have any questions at any time, please jump in. I really want this to be interactive. And yeah, so to begin with, of course, I'm showing you the entrance of the museum, as you see the famous uh, Pyramid of the Louvre that was built in 1989. And that's now the, the main entrance to the museum. You see here on that picture, people queuing. And I'll show you right after a map of the museum. So there are three wings in the Louvre. Here we have the wing Richelieu, the wing Sully, that is the square part here, and the wing Dunant. And all together, there's almost 10 miles of galleries. So of course it takes a lifetime to visit everything as I was saying previously. And here you see the pyramid on the map is here in the middle of the yard. And first I'm going to take you to the department of Egyptian antiquities that is located here. It's on two floors. It's pretty big actually. The Louvre has the second largest collection of art, uh, of Egyptian art in the world after uh, Cairo. And out of the almost 70,000 pieces that are there, I chose one that is really my favorite. That is called the Seated Scribe. It's yeah. a really stunning. Beautiful. Yeah. It's really, st when you spot this statue in the room, you're obviously right away attracted by the eyes that are really spectacular. It's not very big. I mean, you can't see on that picture, but it's only like 20 inches high, which is quite small. And yet it's really striking because it's very realistic. And you see like the amazing detail of the hands and of course those amazing eyes. I'm going to focus on the eyes a little bit later. But this is a very old uh, statue that is, uh, it's hard to date, of course, with precision, but it's probably 2600 BC. And it's from a period that is called the Ancient Empire. And there are, of course, a lot of different varieties of scribe representation throughout uh, Egyptian art history. So this special, like this specific sculpture was found here in Saqqara. I'll show you here on the map where the arrow is. Saqqara used to be one of the capitals of the Egyptian empire. And it was found by French archeologists in the 19th century. That's why it belongs now to, to the Louvre. And it was found- So you mean it was found, so it was really found like, like a, it's a French team that went to dig it yeah. up, yeah? Yeah, the French did a lot of archaeology in Egypt. That's why we have an amazing collection. Mm -hmm. As you probably know, Napoleon was uh, also very much present in Egypt. So that's when really the French started digging and find it, finding some very nice um, treasure. But just so you know, we didn't steal it from the Egyptian because a lot of the searches that were performed were actually um, we had authorization to perform the archaeolo archaeological searches and to bring some of the stuff back to the Louvre. So it wasn't stolen. It was actually with an agreement by the Egyptian government. Good. So it was found in 1850 in very good condition. Um, now I'm going to show you, but you see the color. It's limestone colored with uh, paint and pigments, and it's really, really well preserved because it was buried in a, in a tomb. So it was protected from the natural elements. That's why it's still in such a very good shape, although it's almost you know, 5,000 years old. I'm going to show you different varieties. So as you see in the Louvre, we have very um, different representations of scribes in different material. We have wood, we have uh, here, like some kind of dark stone. But as you see, this specific seated scribe really stands out of the crowd because the color is so striking. And of course, the eyes are very realistic. That's why it's one of the most beautiful pieces. 
So I'm going to show you some more details. So that's the side, the back, and you see there is a basement here, but there is no name on it. Normally, you would always have the name of the scribe written on it. But because the basement is missing, we have no idea about the identity of the character that is represented, unfortunately. So there's a lot of mystery to it because it's not very clear uh, who it was and in what exact circumstances it was found. And just to focus on the hand, I really like the detail of the hand because you see the nails are very delicate. You see with the left hand, he is holding the papyrus. And with the right hand, you see in the position of the hand that he used to hold the brush, which is missing. I mean, it, it was already missing when the French archaeologists brought it back to the Louvre, but we can tell by the position that it was a writing scribe. Another detail of the you think, nails. You think maybe by, by the time when they actually made the statue, he, he had the accessory, he actually had some... Yeah, that's what the archaeologists and the art historians think, that most likely he was represented with the specific uh, pen that the, um, the scribes used to have in their equipment. But it's definitely missing because, of course, it has to be a little bit damaged because, as I said before, it's 5,000 years old. So we do have a question here, Celine. Yeah. Um, Darren is asking us if the scribes were actually held in high esteem in Egypt. Was it a good position in, in Egypt? Yeah, that's why we, that's a very good question, actually. That's why we have so many representations of scribes because they were very high in the hierarchy. At the time, of course, most people didn't know how to read and write. That's why the scribes were there to you know, read letters or write official documents. So they were very well respected. And it was a position that was given from, it was hereditary. If your dad was, well, of course it was only men, but if your father was a scribe, then uh, the son could be a scribe. And it was a very long process. Actually, they had to go to school for 12 years to learn how to, to learn all the skills because it was not only reading and writing, it was also uh, justice, it was administration. They were doing all the different tasks that a society needs. So it was, yeah, a 12 year learning process. So that's why they were very high and very highly respected. And then they deserve to be represented with their own statues. Okay, thank you. And now I'm going to focus on, yeah, of course, the face. You see this amazing face. So you see also the cheekbones are very delicate. The lips are very delicate. And you have this typical makeup, the Egyptian makeup around the eyes. And actually in the eyes here, you see the reflection almost of the person who took the picture. It's because the material is a crystal. And it was sculpted in such a way that it reflects the light. So it looks very, very lively. That's what, may, when you look at it, it's really striking because you really feel like, you know, your his eyes are following you. And for the time, of course, it was really uh, quite amazing to be able to sculpt the eyes like that. And yeah, final. Wow. And the, yeah, the, um, the iris is, is crystal, but there are also a little bit of copper at the back to, to fix them. And the iris is painted at the back of the, of the crystal. That's why it's just very, very sophisticated. Wow. And so, so is, um, how can you describe the, the room where the scribe is in the Louvre? Is it, is it some place where you have like a lot of big stuff or, because I don't yeah. remember well where what it is. I mean it's on the, um, there are two levels in the Louvre with the Egyptian stuff. The more heavy stuff is in the lower ground for obvious reasons. So to see this scribe, you need to go up the stairs and it's a, in a room that is fairly quiet. It's in a window because it has to be protected. So you see it through glass and it's surrounded with um, different representation of scribes. Most of them are, are quite small. And yeah, it's really worth having a look there because very often there are not a lot of people in the Egyptian antiquity section. Great. Well, that was, that was a lovely first piece. Um, yeah. Make sure you see it when the Louvre reopens. It's really something not to miss. Okay. So are we ready to move on? Do we have any more questions? Um, not, not yet, but of course, if you guys want to, you know, uh, ask question at the end, don't hesitate. So let's, yeah, let's jump on the okay. second. We're going to move on to the next piece, which is 
probably my favorite artwork in the Louvre. So now I'm going to take you to this long gallery here. So here actually at the bottom of this picture, there is the Seine River. So there is a very long gallery that is called the Grande Galerie in French, the Great Gallery. It's very, very long. And that's where we have the collection of Italian painting. So I'm taking you to the Italian Renaissance. Here is the inside of this very big gallery that was built uh, in the 16th century. Beautiful. And all that you see here on the walls are Italian paintings. We have a very, very beautiful collection at the Louvre of Italian painting. So I promise not to talk about Mona Lisa, but yet I'm going to talk about uh, Da Vinci. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Here, basically in this gallery, there is a new hanging of the Da Vinci's painting. So here, it's not an amazing picture for the quality, but I wanted you to have an idea of the scale. So here you have three Da Vinci, this one, this one, and this one at, you know, at the very right. It's the picture I'm going to, to talk about. And you see, we have different sizes. And it's a painting uh, so here, yeah, I just wanted to include the five paintings that are owned by the, the Louvre. The Louvre owns five Da Vinci's. It's the largest collection in the world. And that's, yeah, the five, of course, the Mona Lisa. I'm not going to talk too long about it. And that's the four other paintings. And in the middle, we have this stunning lady called La Belle Ferronnière. Here with the frame. Oh, sorry. I'll go back to you. So this painting is actually quite mysterious because we don't know how it landed in the collection of the Louvre. We have information uh, that Da Vinci, when he moved to France, he brought with him three of his paintings. I'm going to show you which. This one on the left, this one that is very large, and the Mona Lisa. We have evidence that he came to France with these with him. And these two there, we don't know how it landed in the royal collection of paintings. So it's really very mysterious. And we don't know who the lady is up to this point, despite you know 500 years of research, we still don't know who the model is. So there are two options. At the time, Da Vinci was in Milan when he painted that, um, that Belle Ferronnière. And he was, uh, an, he was, um, commissioned by the Duke of Milan, who was called uh, Ludovico Sforza. And Ludovico Sforza had a wife here on the left called Beatrice d'Este and a mistress. Well, he probably had more than one mistresses, but his favorite one was this one there on the right called uh, Lucrezia Crivelli. Most likely that's the portrait of this woman, Lucrezia Crivelli. But it's hard to tell. Probably we will never know for sure who it really was because we have very few information about it. But if we, if you look at the pictures, the hair, most likely it's her. So, I mean, it's a really, I really hope you can see it in real also because the, the Louvre in Paris just got it back. It was in the Louvre in Dubai for some time. I don't know if you guys are aware that uh, there is uh, a Louvre that opened in Dubai in 2017. And for some time, the painting was on loan there. So we just got it back last year. So now it's visible. And it's really amazing, of course, you see that I'm going to zoom on the face. Wow. The, the, the eyes are absolutely stunning. She looks very alive. Although I showed you it's quite a small format. Uh, when you're, you are facing, it looks very alive. It's really striking because the presence is very, very strong. And it's, yeah, it's a little bit even. One time I had the chance to be alone with that painting. And it was really weird because I really felt like there was, you know, someone in the room, like the presence was so strong. And only Da Vinci has the power to paint portraits that are that realistic. And that's why people still talk about it today, because paintings like the Mona Lisa or this one at the time when people were looking at these paintings in the 16th century, it was actually very new. It almost like they saw uh, a photograph for the first time. Mm -hmm. And here you see the detail of the jewel on the forehead. So this jewel is now called a ferronnière, like the title of the painting. And if you look, it looks a little bit different with the rest of the painting. You see the hair, the eyes, the face is very delicate. But here the jewel seems a little bit um, 
less sophisticated. So most likely we think that it's a student of Da Vinci who painted it, who finished the painting. Oh, okay. Yeah, not, mm -hmm. it's a supposition, but not all of the details maybe were made by Da Vinci. Here you see the detail of the dress. So again, there is, it's so refining the texture of the fabric. You see all the folding. It's just so, it really looks like photography, mm -hmm. which is stunning. And this dress is called a Spanish dress. It was the fashion of the time, but we know it was worn by women in Milan during the Renaissance. So that's why we have evidence that this woman was um, living in Milan because it's really the fashion of the time. So we do have just two comments from, one from Katy saying that it's beautiful and the other from Rosa saying the lips are very precise and indeed. Yeah, is... actually what is really amazing is that you see there are no contours at all. Normally if you look at a portrait you would see the contours of the nose, of the lips, but here every, everything, all the, the features just melt into each other and only Da Vinci is able to achieve that effect. That's why we know for sure. For sometimes we weren't quite sure if it really was a painting by Da Vinci. The authentication was a little bit, um, we weren't so sure. But now when we see the, the way that the face is painted, only Da Vinci would be able to actually do that. That's why we now come to the conclusion that he painted the face and the dress, but maybe some of the details, as I was saying, were finished by one of his students. Okay, but well, this is, oh yeah. The eyes are amazing. When you are facing the painting, uh, basically what is very odd is like, you don't know if she's looking straight at you or if she's avoiding your eyes and just looking a little bit on the side and you can see both. So you can really interpret it in many different ways. And yeah, it's really, really stunning. I mean, everybody talks about, you know, the, the eyes of the Mona Lisa, but to me, this one is really superior. I mean, it's, she should be really the star of the Louvre because <laughs> you, want to replace, <laughs> you want to replace Mona Lisa by, by like, a, like I a think kid. this portrait is really way more enigmatic and way more beautiful. Yeah. Uh, we do have a, a, just a last question about uh, La Belle Ferronnière. Um, do you think that um, Da Vinci had students working on all of his paintings or just some of them? Uh, actually, yeah, after some time, yeah. Basically, Da Vinci moved to Milan when he was 30 years old in 1482 and he opened a school. So he had about 30 students. And at the time, the way it worked in the in the atelier, in the workshops in the, during the Renaissance is that the master was painting a portrait and all the students were copying. That's why we have many different versions of um, Da Vinci's paintings. For example, there, there is more than one Mona Lisa. I don't know if you guys know, but there are at least three different Mona Lisas that are in different museums. It's because we have copies by the students. And here, I mean, the art historians that studied it very closely really uh, think that there is more than one painter who, who painted it. If you look here, especially if you look at the bottom here, there is a parapet here mm -hmm. at the bottom. It's probably because Da Vinci didn't have time to finish the hands. You see, I mean, here I put a slide to compare because you see in those two other paintings here, you see that the hands are very important. And in the Mona Lisa, the hands are also very important. And here, for some reason, that doesn't look like Da Vinci, we have no hands. And it looks like someone covered the bottom of the painting. Uh, again, probably because Da Vinci didn't finish it and was finished by someone else who didn't have his talent. So he just, it's a supposition, of course, but he just covered it up. Thank you. That that was very I, impressive. We we have I hope that answers your question. Yeah, we have a we have a Maria saying that uh, indeed uh, she thinks like you that La Belle Ferronnière is more impressive than Mona Lisa. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Make sure when you go to the Louvre to have a look, and it's really amazing that now we we're able to see it in the Louvre because it was away for so long, and it was when it was um, in restoration a few years ago so it's the colors are really amazing it's way at some point she was a little bit dark but now she got all her beauty back so really worth having a look
Thank you for this rediscovery. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm totally in love with her. <laughs> okay, we'll move uh, to the next uh, artwork, which is now we're gonna go here in that side of the building. Here we have a very long gallery on that side that is called, as you see, Galerie d'Apollon. It means the Apollo Gallery. And when we open this beautiful gate here, we see this very long corridor that if some of you have been to Versailles, it looks very, very much like Versailles. It's really the same style because this was done under Louis XIV. But what is interesting is that it's actually prior to Versailles because at the time, so that was built in um, the early 1660s because there was a big fire uh, Louis XIV at, at the time was the king of France and because he loved ballet, he had uh, ballets performed in that uh, room of the Louvre. And one night, one of the sceneries of a ballet took fire, so everything burned down, so they had to rebuild it. And they actually, at the time, uh, Louis XIV had his artistic team, which was his prime painter was uh, Charles Lebrun and his architect was Louis Levaux. There are the same guys who later worked uh, in Versailles. And here with this gallery, they basically decided of uh, what would be the style of Louis XIV. And as you see this, of course, it's very Baroque. There's a lot of gold, lots of colors. It's very, very rich. It's almost too much for your eyes to take. Um, so yeah, they, they built the style there and then they basically copy pasted in Versailles. And it's interesting to, because everybody think, thinks that this was copied on Versailles, but it's the other way around. I see. Yeah. And here, I'm going to- the place of the Louvre. Is it? Yeah, I know. I know it's a little bit too much, but I still love it. it too much sometimes is good. I mean, it's a guilty <laughs> pleasure. Like, you know, you take so much in, in your eyes. And also it was renovated two years ago and because yeah, they had to refresh the paintings that are on the ceiling and the tapestries. So uh, it looks re it's very, very sparkling because it was just freshly renovated. So I'm gonna show you some of the details. So here you see the paintings on the, basically the paintings were uh, made between the 17th and the 19th century. So it took actually 200 years to complete this space. You see here on the wall, I'm going to show you the detail. There's a portrait, of course. Louis XIV was very fond of himself, so there's always a lot of um, artworks uh, to his glory. And this is actually not a painting; it's a tapestry. It all of, there are, um, I think, about probably twenty or thirty tapestries all around this uh, gallery, and it really looks like a, a painting. It's quite stunning. And it's in the middle of the room because, of course, everything was built around the figure of Louis XIV. Uh, let me show you here. Basically, the decoration was um, inspired by the rays of the sun around uh, the earth. And here you see the symbol of the sun. And it was when the symbol of the sun was chosen to represent Louis XIV. You know his nickname, the Sun King. And that actually comes from that period and from that uh, specific uh, room of the Louvre. And we also have the zodiac everywhere in the room. You see here, Sagittarius. We have Gemini. So you can pick your sign when you walk around. And here we have uh, also the Capricorn. So yeah, you got an idea of how richly it's decorated. Um, so just uh, one question, quick question. So the Gallery Apollo, so you show us pretty much where it was located. Uh, we have a question, is it on the first floor or on the second floor? If I remind well, this part of the Louvre has, you know, like, like half floors and all of that. So how is this? Yeah, it's one? on the first, it's actually on the first floor. So altogether, the Louvre is five floors including you know, one floor at the very bottom that doesn't really have a lot of artworks. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, on the first floor, it's not very far from the uh, winged victory, this very impressive 
um, Greek sculpture that has no head but amazing wings. You probably all have uh, a picture in mind. It's right behind. So it's on the first floor. But there is a floor zero in France. Yeah. Just remember, for you guys, there is a floor zero and then first floor and then yeah. second floor. Second floor. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, thank and you. It doesn't go higher. We have, uh, there's nothing after the second floor in the roof. It's not actually very, very high as a building. It's more, it's very spread out. Yeah. And here in this uh, Apollo gallery, you see in the middle, we have um, cabinets with an amazing collection of tableware that used to belong to the kings of France. So we have amazing plates. You see here we have uh, cups like crystal, uh, all like the precious things that were part of the, the royal collection. And we also have the collection of the French crown jewelry. So uh, today there's not a lot left because there was of course the French revolution that uh, you know, happened in, at the end of the uh, 18th century. But the, the French collection, the Joyeux de la Couronne in French, it means the, yeah, the French jewelry, the French royal jewelry. I don't know how you would translate. Mm -hmm. uh, today, there are 23 very beautiful pieces left. And this collection began in the 16th century under Francis I. Basically, he started collecting very amazing pieces, like very beautiful diamonds, everything. And today everything is on display in three cabinets. And here in this specific picture, we see the crown uh, that used to belong to Louis XV. I'm gonna show you a closer look. Yeah, it looks like that. Beautiful. Yeah, it's very rich. I mean, I think it has like 300 diamonds, 200 pearls. It's very, again, very Baroque. Uh, and Louis XV for the anecdote, he was crowned when he was only 12. So imagine a 12 year old wearing this. It was very, uh, yeah, a little bit <laughs> over the top. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the French kings were all over the top until <laughs> of course they really got beheaded, but that's a different story. <laughs> and here you see very two beautiful pieces. So you have this diamond here and this one here. Here on the specific, uh, this specific crown that is uh, on display at the Louvre, we have copies of the diamond because the real diamond are presented on the side. Oh. Yeah, so the quality is not very good. Sorry for the quality of the picture. It's just to give you an idea of the scale. So here we have the largest diamond of the French collection that is called the Regent. It's 140 carats. And that's the second largest. It's called the Sancy. And basically this one and this one were, used to be this and this. And then it was taken out because it was reused by the kings after him. All the monarchs use those diamonds, but in different shapes. You know, Napoleon put it on his sword. So it was always like recycled, so to speak. <laughs> I like this idea of recycling diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> of course, they all wanted to wear it, but it was also, according to the fashion, it was, of course, taking different um, formats. And just to give you an idea, I mean, it's hard to tell how beautiful it is because, of course, here I'm showing you a close up. So it's not, um, but you have to see it in real, believe me. Just go there and it's really going to catch your eye. But yeah, at the time, it was the largest uh, white diamond. It was found in India at the end of the 17th century. And the regent, who was um, Louis XIV's grandson, acquired it to be put on this uh, crown of Louis XV when he was um, crown king of France. And just... Yes. Oh, sorry. sorry, yeah, no, we just have a question. Um, do you think the crown was made in France? I mean, I would think so. That's what one of the questions, but. Yeah, it was definitely because they were like official jewelers. It was definitely made in France. I couldn't, I can't remember the name of the, I don't know if I have it somewhere, the name of the guy who made it. No, um, I don't, I can't remember the name of the jeweler, but the Kings of France, we had really amazing jewelers in, in France and it was made to order. I mean, of course it was really designed specifically for, for this king. Okay. Uh, do we have any other 
No, not so far. Okay. And just to give you an idea, this is really a small diamond compared to other diamonds that exist in the world. Like I had a look recently and I think the largest diamond in the world is like 3000 carats. And this is only, so to speak, 140. So <laughs> it's very humble. <laughs> Okay, so we'll move on to then the fourth piece. Mm -hmm. That is uh, the painting that I'm going to present now is, I mean, the museum is closed, but it's, if it was open, it would be in a temporary exhibition that is presented here. In that area, we have um, a space that is called the small gallery. And here the, the Louvre has uh, temporary exhibitions. And currently there is an exhibition called The Advent of the Artist that is about um, self-portrait and portrait throughout art history. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to show you this amazing painting that is called Portrait of a Black Woman. Uh, that is not very known uh, because, I mean, I don't know if it's one of the reasons, but it's by a, a female artist. Uh, that is called Marie Guimin Benoit. This is a self-portrait of her, so you get to see uh, what she looks like. She was born in 1768, uh, so she went through the French Revolution, and she was from a very, uh, I mean, she was from the upper society, so she could study art. And she was one of um, the painter David's uh, students. David is a very renowned uh, neoclassic French painter. He's very famous for his very large historical paintings. You see a lot of his work at the Louvre. And he was the first artist to teach to women. So he had 20 female students. So this uh, lady, marie guimin Benoit, had the chance to study with one of the best painters of, of his time. And it, it, isn't he the one that made the um, coronation of Napoleon? Exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah, for the um, people who are listening, I don't know if you maybe have seen uh, an image of this painting that is so big. I mean, it covers really a whole wall in the Louvre and it represents the moment that uh, Napoleon um, was crowned. So she was the, the student of the best artist of the time. So yeah, so that's why she was very she was very talented and she was very good, and she started showing her work at the official salon in uh, 1791 because it's when the salon opened to women. The salon was since the 17th century a very official uh, event. Every year, the best artists were selected to show their work. And it was, of course, forbidden to women until the French Revolution. And then in 1791, the salon opened to women and foreign artists. Before that, it was only French men who could exhibit their work. And the painting that I showed you right before uh, was presented at the official salon of 1800. So, of course, the subject is quite, you know, it's groundbreaking for the time because it represents, of course, a black woman who was a former slave, but she's represented like a lady of the upper society. To give you an idea of the kind of portraits that we had at the time, here we have two portraits by David, this painter that we were talking about. And it, you see, we can recognize the position of the body. The background is very simple, so it's really the style of the portrait at the time. But of course, here it represents uh, white women of the upper society. Here we have this one on the right. She's, it's a very famous painting too. She's a banker's wife. And here on the left, uh, the family of this woman used to work for the monarchy, so they are very important. So of course, you have a former slave slave represented like a, a lady of the upper class is really stunning for the time. And in 1800, we're only six years after the slavery was abolished for the first time. Actually in France, slavery was abolished twice because Napoleon reestablished it in the meantime. So at many different levels, it's really uh, revolutionary for the time to present a black woman who is the center of attention. She's the only character in the portrait. Um, she's very noble. You see her attitude, like she has a lot of pride. She's also painted like an allegory because of course she's showing a, a breast. So she looks like almost a Greek goddess, which is also a very odd representation for the time. 
and it's really a political statement. You know, it really states that uh, black people are equal citizens. And it refers to the Republic because you can recognize the colors of the French flag here. You see red, white, and blue, which is, of course, the colors of the French flag. So there's a lot of political, it's a very strong political message to, to send, actually, at, at the time. Mm -hmm. And here's the detail of the face. So the lady, you see, she's wearing a turban. I mean, the so. She's very an excellent painter because you see how refined is the work of the, the fabric is really, really realistic. And here the earring is a reference to the origins of this woman who was called Madeleine, who was from Guadeloupe. So she used to be a slave in Guadeloupe and then she moved to France. And she was of course freed in uh, 1794 when slavery was abolished. And, and that, um, sorry. Oh. Yeah, sorry, no, I just about have a question. So, so um, just about the artist, uh, um, just a question about, uh, is she exposed also in Versailles? Do, do we have pictures, uh, oh, pictures, sorry, uh, pieces? Yes. Of uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, it could be. Because yeah. actually, the, this artist, Marie-Guimine Benoit, was very close to, she became an official painter. She was very recognized under uh, Napoleon. So she became one of the official painters of Napoleon. She painted Napoleon's sister. That painting might be in Versailles, actually. I, I have a doubt, but that's entirely possible. Mm. Yeah, okay. that would make sense. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you one more detail. Yeah, here's the detail of the body. And actually also another important point is that for the time, uh, it was really considered a challenge to paint black skin because, of course, in the different workshops or um, schools, people were only learning um, how to paint white people because they would be the people who would commission portraits. So it was considered very risky to, to paint darker um, complexions. And she really succeeded because, you see, there's a lot of nuances. I mean, the, the skin is very, very realistic. And... Basically, at the time, people were too shy to try such an exercise because it was considered very challenging. So, so beside the fact that so she did uh, made a beautiful painting, um, but what was the political reaction to it? So, so did she expose it? What was uh, that? It was actually quite successful. I mean, she exhibited in the yeah the. Uh, official salon of 1800, there was quite a good response because of course she was, and where the painting is beautiful, so people gonna, could only react positively. And also this painter, Marie-Guimine Benoit was quite popular. She later on had a very, very big career. And also to put a little bit back into context, I'm going to show a different picture here. Two years prior to this painting, so that's 1792, uh, 98, sorry. Another painter called Giraudet exhibited this painting of a black character. And it was the first time in French history since 1798 that a black character was the center of, um, of a portrait and was exhibited in public. And at the time, it already created like a wave of uh, shock because it was really groundbreaking for the time to do that. And it was people talked a lot about it but uh, because it was new. But there was also a positive response. So after it sort of paved the way for Marie Guimin Benoit to be able to present that painting two years later. Mm -hmm. And this man here is actually the first black deputy that uh, that had, took place in French history. He was the deputy of Haiti, and he was also a former slave who who basically got free after um, uh, slavery was abolished, and he moved to France to join the convention and get into politics. Nice. Do we have any more questions about um, No, I mean, uh, just uh, the, 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 um, we made the, uh, we think about the liberty guiding the people, you know, this, uh, yeah. when, we, when we see her with her breath out. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a... Uh, yeah, I mean, the... Um, this painting, the liberty uh, leading the people, it comes actually later. It's almost uh, it's 30 years later. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so of course, we also have this idea of the allegory uh, with, you know, the bare boobs. And it's also a symbol, of course, of, you know, strong, you know, motherhood and strength. And but yeah, it it it, it 
reminds us of that painting by Delacroix, but who comes much later in history. Yeah, that's good. The th thank you for, yeah, this, uh, so this yeah. discovery of a, of a female artist, uh, because like you say, uh, we don't have that many. Yeah, there are, that's a very good point. Um, actually, I told you before, altogether, the collection of the Louvre is almost 600,000 pieces. There are not all of them are paintings, but in among the painters, we have not even 30 female artists in the collection of the Louvre. And they are not even all exhibited. So I think there are only 10 of them that are actually on display in the museum. So if you want to see female artists in the Louvre, most of the work that is owned by the Louvre and that is made by female artists is uh, in storage. So that's unfortunate, but you can only get to see about 10 of them. Well, thank you for, for sharing this one. So I think there is one more that you wanted to... Yeah, we have a final. I don't know how we're doing with time. We're going um, to present the final, yeah. Okay, yeah, we have one more. So now I'm going to take you here. You see on the map, there is a little yard here. Actually, we have three yards, but I'm going to tell you about the little one on the right. That is called the Korsabad yard. It looks like that. You see, basically it used to be open. There is a roof here that was made in the 20th century. And here we are in the department of Near Eastern Antiquities. And again, we own these beautiful uh, winged bulls with human heads to uh, French archeologists who actually dug uh, in Mesopotamia and brought back some of these beautiful um, statues. So I'll show you the map. Basically Mesopotamia corresponds today to Iraq and Syria. And here Korsabad is actually the name of this former city that was a palace. And it's here, it's in the north of Iraq. It's a very important archeological site. And the French, yeah, found some amazing stuff and brought it back to the Louvre in the 1840s. So that's the, a map of the city as it was, of course, how it looked like that. It was a very small fortress with seven doors all around the fortress and at, at each door you had two of those beautiful sorry those beautiful um winged bulls you see they are basically the keepers of the fortress so there were two of them at each entrance 14 in total and the french had to actually um break them into pieces to bring them back to paris so they took two and they have to break them down into five blocks to be able to transport them you can barely see. I mean, it's barely visible now. And what is very funny is that uh, there are really mythological creatures. That's what they looked like at the time. Imagine they were painted. Everything was colored. Yeah, you had like pigments and even here you have beautiful friezes on the wall. Everything was painted in very vivid colors. So it's hard to imagine because today we only have them, you know, in like regular stone. So you see that when you look at them from the front, they have two legs, like they look to be, like they are standing on their legs. But when you look on the side, they seem to be walking. It's because they actually have five legs. You see here, one, two, three, four. That is very funny. I love it. So yes, just... it's a little trick to have both them standing and walking. They had to add an extra leg. And they have beautiful wings. They have feather crown here. They have a tiara. They have two pairs of horns. They have beaut a beautiful beard. I'm going to show you more detail. And those creatures, they are very common in that part of Mesopotamia. They were for protection. That's why they are really at the entrance of the fortress, because they are for good luck and they are to, you know, to repulse them, invaders. And here we have a detail. So it's very delicately sculpted. You have the details on here on, of the beard and here of the feathers. It's really, really pretty. And in between the legs, I don't know if I'm going to show you here. It's hard to see, but you have actually writing. I'm going to show you a close up of this writing. So here, this alphabet, yeah, it's beautiful. 
This alphabet is called the cuneiform alphabet. It's um, the type of writing that they were using in Mesopotamia. It was created about 3,000 years before Christ. So it's almost the first form of uh, human writing that exists. And here the text that is written between the legs of the, the winged bulls is basically um, telling the story of the king that found in, founded the city and also threatening invaders. It's really uh, telling that whoever breaks in the city is going to be punished. And yeah, it's a, it's a warning for intruders not to come in. And as a final detail, I'm going to show you a very, because all around, I don't know if you see in the first pictures, we have friezes around the, um, the bulls. And we have a very cute detail. So if you ever go to the Louvre, go to that uh, specific yard and please look for the, the male mermaids. They are quite small, so they are hard to find. But if you look closely, you will find these beautiful uh, male mermaids uh, on the walls among the sculptures. They are really cute. They're actually my favorite detail of the room. So I really wanted to include them. And yeah, so that's it for that. Piece. That's it for the presentation. I don't know if we have any more. Okay. Maybe you can put yourself back. Um, yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen. That that would be that great. Uh, so we can maybe do something like this. Um, but thank you so much, Celine. If you want um, guys to ask us any more comments or question, please do. Uh, if you want to tip your guide, the link is just below this video. You can also comment uh, below the video. You can share it with your friends. Um, so thank you so much for watching us uh, tonight. Thank you, Soline. So that was really your choices and your favorite. Yeah, uh, that was really my top five. It was hard to make a choice because there are so many uh -huh. amazing things to discover. I wanted to show you a good variety of what we have in the Louvre because, of course, we have it's just so much to say so yeah i'm going to give you a little sample of oh, thank you very much and um but i let you all going back to your your life okay. uh, for some of you it's the morning for some of you the evening um but here in france it's uh, it's dark time already so <laughs> so we have to go but thank you again Mwah. ciao bye thank you so much Celine, and see thank you thank you marie hope to see you in real life soon <laughs> <laughs> Bye.